Good morning, afternoon, and evening from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Food Safety. Thank you for joining today's webinar on food safety and One Health approaches to reducing foodborne pathogen and zoonotic diseases. My name is Ahmed Gaballa, and I'm Senior Research Associate at Cornell University, and I'll be your MC today. Our moderator for today is Dr. Paul Ebner, who is a professor of animal science at Purdue University. His research focuses on food safety and the development of practical and effective production methods and technologies to limit bacterial pathogens in both live animals and different type of food animal products. He uses his comprehensive understanding of livestock production and processing systems to deliver high impact extension programs targeted to producer, government official and consumers at local, national and international levels. His area of expertise are phage therapy and biology, the development of, of safe and effective antibacterial therapies for use in food animals and characterization of the role the roles different management practice play in foodborne disease transmission. He is a co PI on a new project funded by the Food Safety Innovation Lab on reducing food pathogen contamination on vegetables in Cambodia. With that, let me ask Dr. Ibner to take over and get us started. Dr. Ibner, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, all the attendees and panelists, for joining us today. We have a very exciting program. I'm gonna go over a little bit of the itinerary agenda and then um, uh, we'll go into the speakers, but we have several uh, very exciting speakers. Um, Sean Baker from USA, Dr. Weedman, Dr. Mwangi, Dr. Kowalczyk. We'll ask each of them to say some, give some words and then uh, we'll have a short question period after Sean Baker. And then after our three next speakers, we will have a larger uh, question and answer session following um, the conclusion of the last speaker. So like Ahmed said, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll, we'll collect those questions and we'll, we can ask the, the panelists that after their talks are done. And with that, I'd like to quickly go to our first speaker, uh, Mr. Sean Baker. Um, if you could advance a slide, please. You have some information there, but I'm gonna give you a little bit more. So Sean Baker is a chief nutritionist for the uh, USAID. <clears throat> in this position, he chairs the agency's Nutritional Leadership Council, oversees the vision of, and strategy of the agency's Center for Nutrition in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and coordinates related efforts across USAID. He also guides USAID's investment and engagement with partners to address malnutrition in developing countries. So prior to joining USAID, um, uh, Baker was the first director for nutrition at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He has over 30 years experience in global uh, public health nutrition, including 25 years living in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Uh, Sean Baker has worked for the Helen Keller International for 19 years, including 16 years as vice president and regional director for Africa. He's also served as county director for Helen Keller International in Niger and Bangladesh. He spent nine years with Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine working with the Niger Health Information System, Center for International Health and Development, Famine Early Warning System in South, Southern Africa and Niger, Madagascar Food and Nutrition Surveillance System. Um, Sean Baker started his career in international development as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo. His service on committees and advisory groups includes a technical review panel for the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Malaria and Tuberculosis, uh, which he chaired until November of 2014. He was the chair of the executive committee of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement and now serves as special advisor. He was also on the board of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition from 2013 to 2016 and now serves on its partnership council. Um, Sean Baker has a master's of public health from Tulane University with concentrations in international health and nutritional epidemiology and earned his bachelor's of science degree in biology from the University of Miami. So thank you for joining us today. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Baker. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that introduction. And thanks to the Food Safety Innovation Lab for, for inviting me to speak on this webinar. Uh, and thank you everyone who's joined us this morning or whatever time it may be from where you're joining. Also, thank you for your indulgence of 
I unfortunately can't stay through the whole webinar, so uh, have qu some questions to me up, up earlier, although I will try to stay through as many of the presentations as possible. I want to start out my remarks of making the case of why nutrition is at the table today. Um, for, and I always think it's useful to remind us of the incredible burden that malnutrition poses, that 45% of all under five deaths are attributable to undernutrition. Uh, we always co couch that and attributable to, but that means at the end of the day, whatever those children died from immediately, if they had been well nourished, they would be alive today. Equally important for those children who survive under nutrition, we know we fundamentally deprive them of optimal cognitive and physical development. And so I make the case that for USAID and our striving for a journey to self-reliance, good nutrition is really that fundamental building block. Um, it, it, however, remains a sector that's grossly under-resourced. Uh, when you look at just the metric of the amount of official development assistance. So that's going from development partners like US government, other governments, et cetera, to nutrition specific interventions. So those interventions designed to correct malnutrition, it's still less than 1% of the budget. So there's this huge disconnect between the burden it represents and the resources going to it. And I use development assistance, but more importantly, it's similarly under-resourced when you look at budgets of governments of high burden countries. Um, I do think though, there's particularly a huge opportunity to start changing that, the face of this, particularly with the increased visibility that food systems are getting globally. And I'll, I, I often characterize of so much of what we do in public health nutrition is digging ourselves out of a hole created by a food system that does not deliver safe, affordable, nutritious food year round. And let me back that up with just a couple of, of, of tidbits of, of a few data points. If you look across low and middle income countries and you look at child feeding behaviors and particularly for that period of six to 23 months where breast milk alone is not remains an important contribution to the diet, but is not adequate. And the nutrient needs of those infants and young kids are very high. Across low and middle income countries, where only 18% only of infants and young kids are getting a minimum acceptable diet, 1-8%, which is a really stunning number of how we are not delivering adequate nutrients to infants and young kids during the period when they absolutely need the highest quality diets. Now, of course, part of that is behavioral. And I think we've learned a lot about how do we support moms, other caregivers and households to use resources well, to feed infants well. But a huge part is also affordability and accessibility. Um, you all may have seen the 2020 uh, <clears throat> State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report uh, which gave some pretty alarming numbers of growth of food insecurity, I think. But one of the hallmarks of the report was also looking at the cost of a nutritious, healthy diet. And it estimated that worldwide, 3 billion people could not afford a healthy diet. To bring it down to me to much more concrete terms, um, I always look at the cost of an egg and why I do this, because an egg is... Uh, such a nutrient dense food is highly desirable, is a great food for feeding infants and young kids and feeding pregnant lactating moms. And we often promote these in nutrition programs. But if you are, for example, in Nigeria and not even in the poorest wealth quintile, but that fourth quintile, one egg represents 44% of your daily income. So it's really unimaginable that poor households are going to be able to, to buy enough eggs to meet the nutrient needs of their family. Uh, a similar stunning statistic is from uh, across the border up north in, in Niger and Niger, Niger Republic of if you compare egg calories to the calories coming from staple foods, egg calories are 23 times more expensive than staple food calories. So again, poorer households faced with the choice of how they're gonna feed their kids, 
are clearly going to load up on staples and cannot afford those nutrient dense foods. Um, and now I focused in on the needs of infants and young kids, but if you look at the diets of pregnant and lactating women, even though we don't have the same data across all low and middle income countries, from what we do have, it's an equally germ situation. Was, we're also not meeting the nutrient needs of moms during the times where they need high, the highest nutrient needs. Um, now, part of the challenge when you take, look, and where it's very relevant today's discussion is that when you look at the food system, so much of what we care about to offer that nutrient density is coming from perishable products, be it fruits and vegetables or animal source foods such as dairy, eggs, and meat. Uh, and of course, as you all know better than I do and very relevant today's discussion, an additional layer of complexity besides the perishability of animal source foods, which are so essential to the diets, is the risk they can pose for zoonotic diseases if the sourcing of those foods, either from harvesting from natural, from wild sources or farming is not done appropriately. When I think of food safety uh, and, or more appropriately, the, the issues of unsafe foods, it's really having a triple hit. Uh, it has a direct impact on excess morbidity or mortality. The latest estimates is that unsafe food alone is the triple cause of about 420,000 deaths a year with a big chunk of that burden in infants and young kids. In addition, as we're trying to promote these perishable foods, if they are unsafe, that really undercuts our ability to promote them. And certainly consumers having bad experiences with per perishable foods, their desire to spend money and consume those foods is completely undercut. And then there's the third that it has big economic hits, uh, the hits on the, the economic returns of the producers and the sellers and the households. And then overall, since so much, we have so much loss of those perishable, of those perishable nutrient dense foods, it contributes to that increased cost and lack of availability of those foods. And of course, there's this fourth layer of a challenge of how do we ensure adequate, affordable, safe animal source foods while also making sure we're not contributing to risk of zoonotic diseases? And so that all may sound a bit daunting of these challenges, but I actually am quite optimistic and for several reasons. I think that for nutrition, we've recognized now for a long time, and I think we're starting to turn that recognition into the way we practice, that we do need multiple sectors to come together to deliver good nutrition outcomes, the health sector, the food system, social protection systems. And so there's already ingrained in the way we think in nutrition of working across sectors and across partnerships that is uh, represented in USAID, for example, with our multi-sectoral nutrition strategy, the architecture we put into place with the Leadership Council working across multiple bureaus, resilience and food security, global health and humanitarian assistance, and our regional bureaus to tackle nutrition as an all of USAID issue. More importantly, it's, it, it, it's taking place in countries as countries have joined the scaling up nutrition movement, and they're now, I think, 61 countries and four states in India, they put into place these multi-sectoral coordination platforms to bring these different sectors together. And that's where I think the interface between One Health and nutrition can be extremely strong because the One Health approach recognizes very explicitly that you need to work across sectors, you need to work across disciplines if you're really going to tackle these issues of, of zoonotic diseases while preserving the necessary uh, nutrition and economic benefits of, of animal source foods. And I think, as I said at the beginning, uh, the, um, the advent, the, the huge rise in concern about food systems that are not delivering the outcomes that are required for the world to reach its development goals is a huge opportunity to get nutrition issues much more at the center of the discussion. And so I'm really convinced that if 
when working at a, these One Health approaches, we ensure that nutritious, safe, nu nutrition and food safety are really at the core of the One Health discussions, we can make huge contributions to the aspiration of uh, realizing safe, affordable, nutritious food year round. So really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you today. I look forward to hearing these presentations and how we can really bring the thinking of nutrition and One Health together. Thank you, Paul. I'm back over Thank to you. you. Um, that was wonderful. And we do have uh, some questions that have come in from the chat and I'll start and you talk, you touched on this. And the question is if, if you could give some examples of USAID's current long-term programming goals that are targeted at disrupting zoonotic disease transfer. Yeah, and thank you for that. I think um, the one of the biggest examples is something that was announced recently, uh, Stop Spillover, which is part of the US government's uh, global health security strategy. And it's being led by Tufts University, a $100 million investment to look at how do we actually manage uh, to prevent future pandemics from emerging. And I think uh, Ahmed or, or Mira can put into the chat box the link to that program, but I think it's a good example of how we're trying to bring together the best researchers across the world uh, to really address these challenges and get ahead of the curve so that we're not, we're not caught in these situations again. Sure. And this is very similar, but COVID-19 obviously has underscored that they're emerging zoonotic threats, disease threats, some we know, some we have no idea about. But do you think there's opportunities to investigate these, these future strategic partnerships among the livestock, animal health, and food safety innovation labs to draw on our collective expertise to find research-based solutions to these, these uh, challenges, persistent challenges, and, and the ones that are emerging, and like I said, the ones that we, we don't know about yet? Yeah, and I, you know, I think there are increasing opportunities and in, again, where I put this in the opportunity category, because certainly the current pandemic has underscored how essential it is to be very mindful of the risks of zoonotic diseases. At the same time, it's pressured the food system and we've seen the, the vulnerabilities to the food system and how we need to make sure that the food system continues to be able to deliver safe, affordable, nutritious food. To me, um, one of, I think, the specific opportunities related to USAID is in, uh, within the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security, we've adopted a uh, a food systems conceptual framework to let us better lay out within the food system, what are these points of vulnerability and how do we actually bring together the research and the evidence to help address those points of vulnerability. And I think all of this discussion is relevant in terms of how do we work hand in hand with leadership in country to help identify the most critical points of risk and how do you help bring the evidence to the table to support the right policy decisions and drive the research agenda that is going to be helpful to countries to make sure they're armed with the evidence necessary in their settings to guide the, the policies and programming. Okay, good. Um, uh, Denise Van Weissen, who's a nutritionist in Nicaragua, uh, wanted to, she really appreciated your egg cost comparison example, and wondered if you used it, there's another food example with a similar context. Uh, I you... don't have one off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, I think the egg one, and again, it's obviously, as you pointed out, is not to get obsessed specifically about eggs or think Correct. that eggs are the only solution, but since eggs are almost ubiquitous, I think everybody can immediately understand that cost comparison. Yeah, it's a very uh, understandable unit. Uh, so it's a very understandable unit, but I think the, that's the issue though of then what are understandable units in your setting and how you get those data on them? Because I do think it's um, uh, one of the big challenges that I find it continues when I, while, while we've made progress, I think with people working in agriculture, food systems and food security, still the headlines numbers all are about calories. Yeah. And they're not about 
all those other parts of the, the, the nutritious parts of the food system and the reality of what's the availability, what they cost. I mean, you look at fruits and vegetables and the cost, even the basic availability of fruits and vegetables, not even talking about the affordability. And uh, there's almost no country that's actually producing enough fruits and vegetables to meet uh, dietary guidelines. Uh, so I do think those sorts of analyses can really drive home the messages to decision makers about how essential it is to, to focus on the nutritious parts of the food system, including animal source foods. Okay, we have this other question. This is a good one, it's, and it's going to bring in some other factors for livestock production, sometimes in particular, but um, environmental sector is critical for long-term sustainable uh, food security. And how does balance, how does USA balance food security with environmental health? And this may become more important as livestock systems intensify. Right. And no, that's a good point. And you know, I'm I'm not the environmental expert at USAID. I would underscore that when we look at the conceptual framework we develop, I mean, we develop we've adapted from other conceptual framework. Understanding the environmental footprint and mitigation is also part of it. And so to be very thoughtful about uh, how do you balance, how do you make these trade-offs and how do you work hand in hand with particularly partner governments to make these trade-off decisions and understand uh, what the, the different demands on the food system where if you're, we're looking for obviously to generate healthy, nutritious diets, safe diets. We also need to make sure that it's balancing out the, the use of natural resources, that it's also generating employment, et cetera. So I think being very specific and explicit about the different demands on the, on the food system, doing the analyses to guide policy and country is, is one of the things we really are striving to do. Okay, we do have, can you take one more question? Um, I will try to. All right, let's do it. <laughs> so um, there, there's a tiny comment um, about giving the risks of wildlife and dependence that rural and impoverished com communities have on wild animal sources. Um, just noting the importance to, to uh, shift the urban luxury demand away from wildlife. And the, the question is, in, in a One Health approach, would you consider adding sustainable to the qualities that you listed? So a safe, affordable, sustainable, nutritious food. Uh, no, I thanks for that call out. And I, yes, I would. Uh, and I also think the, and I see the question in the chat. I think it's an important one because um, I do think there's a risk of inappropriately demonizing uh, let's say sustainable harvesting of natural food resources, if we conflate it totally with uh, fresh food markets, or as I think very important, what, what the, the bigger risk I believe with zoonotic diseases from, from wild animals is not uh, populations that sustainably harvest wild food sources, but it's actually the, the inappropriate marketing for a luxury market, which is in fact not contributing to the livelihoods and nutrition of particularly rural populations. And I, I, I'm belaboring the point because I think these are exactly the sorts of analyses that are so critical to understand, you know, what, what really first understand people's diets, where those diets are coming from if there are risks, understanding how do you trade off those risks? And then at the same time, you're looking, what are the true risks of foodborne disease and zoonotic diseases? So you have a full understanding of the different risks and what are the pieces that you really need to address so you're, you're tackling the biggest risk factors without undermining the, 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 the good things you want to be delivered. All right, wonderful. So um, in the interest of time and your time especially, um, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to, to join us today and answer those questions. That was very insightful and uh, very much appreciated by everyone. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you, everybody. And uh, I look forward to hearing a readout of the full uh, webinar today. Sure, sure. Thank you.
Okay, and with that, we're going to uh, go on to our next speaker. Like I said earlier in the in the introductions, we have three speakers that we'll hear from right now, and then we'll we'll uh, collect questions for everyone in the end. Um, our first speaker it's uh, Dr. Martin Weedman, and you can see some information, but I'm going to give you some more again. So, Dr. Weedman is the Geller uh, Family Professor of Food Safety at Cornell University. He holds both the veterinary doctorate, so a DVM, from uh, Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich and a PhD in food science from Cornell University. His work addresses food safety from primary production to the consumer, and his professional career is focused on comprehensive farm-to-table approaches to food safety and food security. Uh, he has published more than 300 peer-reviewed publications with more than 10,000 total citations and also has ex extensive expertise in extension and international food safety work. Uh, he's managed an independent lab since 1999 and also managed Cornell's dairy food extension team for 10 years. This team provides training as well as hands-on in plant support, not just in New York, but across the US and internationally. He is also the co-director of the CDC funded Food Safety Center of Excellence, which is a joint effort between Cornell University and New York State Department of Health. And this position provides him with specific expertise on the role of public health agencies in assuring food safety. He's able to access uh, public health expertise to support projects through his role with the New York State Food Safety Center of Excellence. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Weedman, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Paul. Um, so my job today is gonna be to provide a short overview and introduction on um, zoonoses and the impact and importance of zoonoses for food safety, animal diseases, and one health with the ultimate goal of creating resilient food systems. Next slide. I'm going to start out with the take home messages and I'm going to repeat them at the end to drive them home. So what I hope I'm going to impress on you today is that zoonoses have multifaceted impact. We already heard about it. It's not just human illness, it's animal illness and death reduce productivity, therefore reduce productivity of food systems. Trade issues, food distribution issues can affect tourism, et cetera. Therefore, resilient food systems need improved control of zoonotic diseases. The next point might not be a popular one. I see one of the key impediments to better control of zoonoses, the lack of proper surveillance. And we've all heard the sayings of, you can't, you can't measure it, you can't improve it measure what you treasure. But I think in many parts of the world, we still don't follow those, those mantras. Why is this so, so important? And why is this so um, not unanimously agreed upon? Because very often it's like, well, if you have money, if you have resources, let's fix something. Let's not just measure it. But if we don't measure it, if we don't have surveillance, we don't know whether intervention strategies work, we don't know where to focus. So I'm gonna, Repeat this a few times yet. We need to develop good surveillance systems to really improve um, our control of zoonoses. Next slide. Many zoonotic pathogens can be transmitted through different means, not just food, but also direct contact airborne. Once again, the lack of surveillance often um, impedes our ability to know the importance of the different transmission routes, and that impedes our ability to con improve control of zoonoses. There are challenges lying ahead. Uh, COVID-19 taught us many things, including that, you know, so the, the potential impact of zoonosis is so much bigger than the general population ever sort of appreciated. And so we need a multifaceted approach, surveillance, vaccine, traditional food safety practices to really lessen the impact of zoonoses on food systems. Next slide. Here's what I'm gonna to do today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what zoonoses are, and then I'm gonna talk about the past, the current, and the future. Next slide. So these are the textbook definitions of what zoonotic diseases are. It's a disease that is transmitted from animals to humans or from humans to animals. It goes both ways, and we sometimes forget that. Another important characteristic is that these organisms may or may not produce clinical illness in animals. A number of E. coli strains don't produce um, illness in animals, but still are transmitted from animals to humans. The transmission routes may include direct transmission from animals to humans, rabies being a textbook example, indirect transmission of, to humans through ingestion, inhalation, or contact with environments that have been contaminated with animal waste, dead animals, et cetera. Lepto, anthrax are great examples. The important thing here is this indirect transmission or even the direct transmission 
may include a singular initial transmission event where the organism then subsequently spreads in human populations or continued animal to human transmission. And finally, zoonoses also include arthropod borne diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans. Next slide. If you want to simplify it, by down, it's diseases that are caused by infectious agents that can be transmitted between animals and humans. And again, this can be a back and forth. Next slide. So what, you know, some of us on this call might think of sort of, you know, paths of, of microbial hazards. There's still the current zoonotic hazards in many parts of the world. You know, tuberculosis, Q fever, brucellosis. In many parts, we think of them as a, as a thing of the past. They still extract major public health impacts in many countries of the world, and they are zoonotic. Salmonella, challenge all over the world. You know, maybe the number one zoonotic um, pathogen, zoonotic foodborne pathogen there is, in my mind. You know, parasites, then we have viruses. These are typically not foodborne, as COVID-19 is not foodborne, but there can be very, very important zoonotic pathogens. Next slide. I'm going to illustrate these points with a few examples. Q fever, Coxiella burnettii. Sheep and cattle are hosts, worldwide distribution. We often think of it as sort of an uncommon rare disease. It was more or less under, brought under control with milk pasteurization. You know, not the case. I mean, we've seen increases in Q fever in, in a number of countries. Here's one example in French Guiana, where we have 150 cases per 100,000 people in 2005. You think of this in the U.S., the numbers are extremely low. We may have probably less than 10 cases a year all over the, across the U.S. So, yeah, this is a disease that's very difficult to do surveillance because you can't grow it with traditional methods, et cetera. Might be hugely underestimated. I'm not saying it is, but I see it as an example of an underappreciated um, zoonotic pathogen that we need to focus on. Next slide. Another example of diseases that we understand, that we realize are important in humans, but we forget that they're zoonotic. Tuberculosis, great example. Um, it's not just Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the organism is transmitted from humans to humans, but there's Mycobacterium bovis. Affects cattle, can impact wildlife, and can be transmitted from animals to humans. Important cause of economic losses, trade barriers, particularly likely to create negative outcomes for poor and marginalized populations. 150,000 cases of human zoonotic tuberculosis were estimated in 2016, more than 10,000 deaths, most heavily in Africa. Surveillance, lack of good surveillance, is one of the issues we have that makes it very difficult for us to estimate the true burden of zoonotic tuberculosis. Next slide. Um, transmission occurs through foods. Again, some of us who, who live in, in you know, High-income countries forget this, that tuberculosis can be and is a foodborne disease. And in many countries of the world, it still is. An underappreciated route that we may not do as much as we need to do. This is important for a number of reasons, including that tuberculosis that you acquire from animals might not be as easily detectable, so you might underdiagnose it. It is also an issue because the TB that you acquire directly from animals, so mycobacterium bovis, is actually resistant to at least one antibiotic. That's part of the standard anti-TB treatment. So if I get a tuberculosis um, patient and I start treating with standard treatment because I don't know whether it's zoonotically acquired or acquired through human-to-human -human transmission, treatment may fail. So two examples of the you know, challenges of zoonotic diseases that some of us may think is a thing of the past. Next slide. Let's move on to the current. Zoonotic so foodborne pathogens, you know, in bacteria, we have Salmonella, Campylobacter, Enterohemorrhagic, E. coli, and Listeria, all of them zoonotic. Vibrio is a foodborne pathogen, but I would not consider it zoonotic. Um, Salmonella is the big hitter, and I mentioned it before, I'll mention it today. Again, 3.4 million cases of non-typhoidal infections, um, invasive non-typhoidal infections, more, almost 600,000 deaths. So you can see this is more than the total estimated deaths due to foodborne diseases that Sean mentioned. Why? Because a number of these transmission events are zoonotic, probably. Um, viruses, yeah, none of them. Again, we talked about none of these viruses are zoonotic. Parasites, a number of them are zoonotic. Next slide. 
So this is the current, and again, take home message, salmonella is our key um, challenge. Now, if you look in the future, you know, once again, we need surveillance, but the surveillance, you know, for the unknown is different than the surveillance for the known. We need different types of surveillance. We need to have either um, different tools, you know, molecular tools could be one, or we need to have some better syndromic surveillance where we look at symptoms and try to trace it back to sources and then try and find the pathogens that cause these. If we don't do this, we're gonna, we're gonna see a continued higher impact of zoonosis on global health and resilience of our food systems. Next slide. This is illustrated, and obviously with an international audience, I always try to not use too many U.S. examples. But even if we look at the U.S., you know, our estimate is about 10 million episodes of foodborne illness due to known pathogen. For about 40 million estimated due to unknown pathogens. So this is part of the future that we will detect these unknown pathogens. They might become spread more. They might cause more severe disease. They might be new or unknown. So we cannot underestimate the importance of the unknown unknowns in zoonotic diseases. Next slide. Um, here's a couple examples of, of the sort of things that, that we see and that we're going to continue to see. You know, this is the known known. So this is Seminole typhimurium. But what do we see? Emergence of highly drug resistant organisms, emergence of organisms that might adapt to different hosts, might adapt to more human um, causing human disease more effectively. So major challenge, again, we need surveillance so that we then identify transmission pathways so that we can intervene. Next slide. And then, you know, we can't talk about zoonoses without, talk, without talking about resistance genes and antimicrobial resistance. Simplifying it, it comes in two flavors. We have zoonotic pathogens that may acquire antimicrobial resistance in animal populations and be transmitted from animal populations to humans. But we also can have non-pathogenic organisms, organisms that don't cause disease, but have antimicrobial resistance, could be transmitted to humans. And then in the human, the genes move from a non-pathogen to a pathogen to cause an impact in, in human disease and, and resistance. That transmission from a non-pathogen to a pathogen can obviously also happen in the animal host. Again, surveillance, surveillance with molecular tools in this case, will be important to get an estimate of the scope, the types of things, issues we see in order to implement appropriate interventions and monitor how effective they are. Next slide. So back to the take home messages. I hope I've given you a little bit more that impressed on you the various impacts zoonoses have. I hope I impressed on you how important surveillance is and not one size fits all. We're talking about syndromic surveillance where we look at symptoms. We're talking about microbiological surveillance. We're talking about surveil molecular surveillance. It's not just one, but we need better surveillance to make continued advances and to develop sustainable systems that control and reduce the impact of zoonosis on human health and our food systems. Next slide. Next slide. Um, Many zoonotic pathogens, okay, go back on Ahmed. Many zoonotic pathogens can be transmitted through different means. I hope I've shown that to you. Uh, sometimes we forget about this. Remember the mycobacterium tuberculosis rat. And I hope I've given you a little bit of an idea of the challenges that lie ahead. Not that COVID-19 hasn't taught you about them already, but I may have given a few more that in general are pretty well established. So hopefully with this, I've given a, a short introduction overview of zoonoses and what I see as some of the major challenges in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weedman. And uh, for those with questions, we encourage you to put them in the chat. And we have uh, uh, two more speakers. And what we'll do is have a panel after that where we, we ask those questions together. So I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker. It's uh, Dr. Thumbi Mwangi. Uh, he is an infectious disease epidemiologist with interest in epidemiological analytical modeling tools for the control and prevention of animal diseases and improvement of human health and welfare. He trained as a veterinarian at the University of Nairobi and received a PhD in infectious disease epidemiology from the University of Edinburgh. Based in East Africa, Thumbi is the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Animal Health, <coughs> excuse me, 
and holds the positions of clinical associate professor at the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health at Washington State University, a senior research fellow at the University of Nairobi Institute of Tropical and Infectious Diseases, and chancellor's fellow in global health at the University of Edinburgh. He is affiliate uh, fellow of the African Academy of Sciences, serves as the chair of the Kenyan, uh, Kenyan National Technical Committee on COVID-19 Modeling, a member of the National Rabies Elimination Coordination Committee, uh, Kenya's Zoonotic Technical Working Group, and the Technical Review Committee of the African Union uh, Africa Risk Capacity Epidemio Epidemics and Outbreaks Program. So he served as a member of the World Health Organization Rabies Modeling Consortium, as well as the WHO Rabies Expert Group. With that, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Mwangi, and I'll hand it over to him. Many thanks uh, for the invitation to make this short presentation on food safety and zoonosis in, us, in East Africa. Um, I'll be speaking about the work that we do um, on zoonosis, but also I would like to start with a slide describing the work that we do with the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Animal Health. Next slide. The idea for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Animal Health is to have a view of human health and nutrition um, through the lens of livestock. So the idea is that we can have interventions on the livestock side that impact on human health and human nutrition and welfare. Um, the research that we are uh, engaging in is on the development of pensite diagnostics for one of the big animal diseases, which is not zoonotic, uh, but has a really big impact on, on, on livelihoods and, and, and health of animals and also nutrition access for, for humans. Uh, and we will be working also on the improvement of vaccines against the disease, but importantly, um, looking at the integration of social and economic issues that would affect adoption of animal health interventions um, and, 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 and being able to quantify, as the previous speaker mentioned, um, quantify the effect or the impact of uh, animal health interventions on human health and nutrition. <clears throat> the second big part of it is to to create capacity uh, within, you know, where we have a high burden of this uh, kind of infections uh, within, within, within Kenya and East Africa by training PhDs attached to this, this research projects, um, training master's uh, graduate fellows, uh, postdoctoral fellows, uh, providing research, att research attachments to undergraduate students so as they can, um, you know, get interested in animal health research and, and eventually be the change you know, in the coming days as, 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 as innovators. And, and the last part of it is to build capacity within the local institution, and in this case, is the University of Nairobi, uh, to be able to deal with animal diseases, uh, starting with East Coast fever and supporting animal health research uh, infrastructure within, within the region. Next slide. So when we speak about food safety and zoonosis in the context of, uh, say, East Africa or most of the African continent, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's dramatic. It's, it's headlines as this where we have people who have, um, you know, consumed, um, you know, like meat that is infected with anthrax or, or, or like this very recent article here that was talking about one of the delicacies within the city of Nairobi um, where people enjoy wet fry, which is pork cooked uh, you know, in, a, in a steaming way. Um, and there has been some reports showing that you know, undercooked pork um, can, is associated with uh, cases of epilepsy. <clears throat> so these are the kind of, when you talk about food safety in the region, this is the kind of uh, thinking that you get from the public. I think the main issue really is that um, we have data showing we have high prevalence and likely high burden due to foodborne zoonotic pathogens. The way these infections would manifest in animals and in humans is through diarrhea or septicemias. And unfortunately, that is common for many infections. So making attribution is um, a doubting task. Um, next slide. So to um, you know, deal with this problem. What what you have done is that you have been conducting studies, um, you know, over multiple years that compares health of animals and the health of the people. Basically, people and the animals living within the same households, 
And what we find is um, if you look, for instance, at cases reported of human illness in a household over a year, there could be fever, there could be respiratory illness, there could be diarrhea, um, there could be joint pains. Um, and also look at what they report for the animals. The distribution of these cases are actually quite, quite, quite similar. And, and I'm showing in this uh, graphs on your right. Um, and what we find is that there is a, really a, a strong correlation between say the total number of household illnesses reported in people and the number of illnesses or death cases in animals. Um, in fact, they are even statistically significant. You, we, we make estimates of about for every um, 10 cases of animal illness um, and death in, um, in animals, the risk of having a human uh, case within that household goes up by about 30%. Now, this is all you know, fevers, diarrhea, respiratory illness that could be associated with food, uh, with food bone zoonosis. Next slide. Um, so in, the, in thinking about zoonosis in the region, we, we've got a lot of uh, endemic and epidemic uh, zoonotic uh, diseases. So for instance, um, for a country like Kenya, we listed up to 36 different zoonotic diseases suspected or known to be in Kenya or in the East African region. And you know that even out of the 20 um, neglected tropical diseases uh, in the WHO list, uh, half of them are zoonotic. So when posed with this kind of um, you know, um, big burden of infectious diseases, the question is what should governments uh, focus on? Um, and, and this is a really difficult question. And the way we have sort of tried to go around it is to use some semi-quantitative prioritization processes that we bring in um, you know, stakeholders from the human health sector and also from the animal health sector, and they help identify the diseases that can be, uh, should be, the country should be prioritized, uh, make a priority of. Next slide. So to do that, um, what we did is come up with a criteria of what, like what is important um, for a disease to be prioritized. And, and, and the groups came up with uh, five criteria of uh, what's the severity of illness associated with the infection, what's the epidemic potential, does it have you know, big socioeconomic impact, how prevalent is it in, in humans and animals, and are there any available interventions. Now the results of uh, that semi-quantitative process is what I show on this bar graph on the left which is a priority list of the top 10 infectious diseases that of zoonotic origin within the country. Um, and, 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 and out of those, what we can tell is that um, the priority foodborne diseases are actually anthrax, brucellosis, rift valley fever, uh, hydatidosis, uh, and, uh, NTS, and, and Q fever. Now, these are much more dramatic than you know, your usual foodborne uh, bacterial zoonosis. Um, and, 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 and this may be as a result of not just the five criteria that you've mentioned here, but also this is what people will possibly remember if you ask them uh, what, what, what infectious diseases or zoonotic origin uh, are important for them. Next slide. Now that result is not only true for Kenya, there's been a nice paper uh, by Salia here uh, looking at this kind of prioritization process for different countries. Um, and like what you have observed within this, this country, most prioritized zoonosis are actually of endemic uh, nature. Um, and it's important to note that you know, focus on these endemic uh, infections is really critical for enhancing uh, rapid detection and response to outbreaks of emerging zoonotic diseases. Again, um, even for many countries here, and you're looking at Thailand, Kenya, Ethiopia, Cameroon, South Africa, DRC, uh, the priority food bone uh, zoonosis are this anthrax, brucellosis, salmonellosis, uh, zoonotic TB, as the previous speaker was talking about, leptospirosis, and some of these epidemics is like rift valley fever. Next slide. Um, so we 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 looked at um, what the priority infections you know, different countries are mentioning um, and also looked at what kind of research has been done 
around these infections. And what we see is um, in the top graph on your left um, is that there's obviously a really growing uh, demand and, and, and products uh, for zoonotic disease research, uh, particularly in the last 10 or so years. Uh, but importantly, a lot of these diseases um, and research programs have only been really simple cross-sectional studies, many epidemiological, there's very little socioeconomic work, there's very little uh, lab-based uh, research. Um, and, and, and also that uh, if you only went into PubMed or you know, databases where work is published, you'd be surprised that you only get a really small proportion of the work done in these areas. So for instance, uh, only 11% of this is research at master's and postgraduate or PhD level is published. And even the publishing takes up to three years, 2.5 years on average for the manuscript to be published. Um, the other thing to, to note from this work is that it appears uh, the diseases where most of the research has been done are associated with a research group that has been very productive for the last 10 or 15 years. And so it's not a wide uh, view of all the diseases that are of priority to the country that have been focused on. I think is, this is very much driven by the individual researchers and their interests. Next slide. So um, maybe the question to ask is, what are the foodborne zoonosis issues in the region? Um, and there's this nice convergence model back in 2011 um, that, that um, resonates very well with the previous speakers that when dealing with this kind of uh, infections, it has to be multidisciplinary work because what, what the result out of many different things, some of them physical factors, ecological factors and biological factors. And I thought I, I should just take an example of three key issues and, and, and demonstrate that in the next few slides. So are they an important public health problem? What are the key scientific questions to improve their prevention and control? And if you had interventions, which would be the most appropriate ones and how can they be optimized? Next slide. So are foodborne zoonosis a public health problem? The, the, the long and short of it is that we really have limited data on estimates of the health and economic burden of foodborne zoonosis. Um, and, and I think they've, I would term them to actually be neglected in the region uh, because on the human side, we are concerned more with say HIV, malaria, tuberculosis. On the animal side, we're interested more in the big trade transboundary diseases like foot and mouth disease. And some of these other infections that are part of the NTDs who rarely get good health and economic data. And that is what drives um, you know, responses or government uh, responses to reducing the infections. But what we can tell at least from some of the data, like what has been published by Sam Karaoke and others, is that if you look at, for instance, the food value chain, um, even go to the outlets, that a lot of that meat is, um, is, is contaminated with E. coli. Um, and that if you look at generally the, um, you know, the burden of uh, foodborne diseases and the dialysis associated with that, it's highest in Africa compared to other regions. Next slide. So in, in, in dealing with, and I take just two of the top target uh, infectious diseases in, in the country, and, and I take creep valley fever, which is a foodborne disease, but also comes, you know, you can get infected by, um, you know, coming into contact with infectious material. Uh, there are questions around how do you have a good uh, surveillance system for this kind of uh, disease. The second really important thing is we, we have limited resources. Are you able to have a surveillance system that is targeted? Can you identify the hotspots of infection? And that, that important one is, even though we know that we have got this big disease, are there, what's the efficacy of potential interventions that can be used against uh, this food boom series? Next slide. And, and even more of a wicked problem is like brucellosis. We know within a herd, you have sheep, you have goats, you have cows and camels, they all get brucellosis. Uh, it's not clear who is a reservoir in many of these places. Um, and, and in the context of multi-host, multi-pathogen systems, the questions are around identifying the reservoirs where you can actually um, you know, show your, or, or put in your interventions. The second really critical thing is um, once you've got even identified interventions, who funds and why should they? Who funds those interventions? And, and what we found with a lot of the zoonotic diseases in the, this region is that having some 
cost effectiveness that can't convince governments to put in their own money because it saves them money. It's really critical. The other thing is that even when you have got interventions, planning and effectively rolling out those interventions, making sure there's adoption of the interventions is a really critical thing. Next slide. So in summary, um, I would say that the real issues are around having proper estimates of health and economic burden of foodborne zoonosis. Um, and that requires investment in a surveillance system that can improve detection and attribution of foodborne zoonosis. And that this is, needs to be multidisciplinary, has to bring really different disciplines from, from the human health, animal health, economist, ecologist, all of that. The second thing is that in the context of uh, limited resources, um, there is need for targeting interventions. And the idea of knowing where you have the biggest burden, um, which are the control points that can be manipulated to minimize the risk of transmission and burden is really critical. So that one is that, and I take this example actually from a non-foodborne zoonosis like rabies, that we have got an excellent vaccine for over 100 years. Why we still got a lot of um, people dying of rabies is that we have not been able to optimize the delivery of these interventions. And I think that is true as well for foodborne zoonosis, even when you've got a good vaccine or you've got good behavioral change uh, messages, the way you deliver them and make them adopted uh, at the community level to reduce um, you know, the burden is really critical. And, and obviously, um, I think our experience is you cannot do this as vertical programs. There really has to be integrated within the existing national human and animal health programs. Next slide. A lot of this work is uh, thanks to funding from um, this, this, this uh, bodies here, but also I'd like to thank my graduate students and, um, and also the few, few staff that we work with for this work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McWangi, um, for sharing your experience, insight. And I, again, encourage all the listeners, participants to add questions in the chat, because uh, we will have, after our, this final speaker, um, some time to go over some of those questions. So with that, I'd like to introduce our, our last speaker. It's Dr. Uh, Barbara Kowalczyk. She's a faculty member at the Ohio State University in the Department of Food Science and Technology and director of the Center of Foodborne Illness Research and Prevention. She's also affiliated with the Ohio State's Translational Data Analytics Institute, Global One Health Initiative, and the College of Public Health. She's an expert in food safety or experience in training in epidemiology, biostatistics, risk analysis, and public policy. Dr. Kowalczyk works to advance more systems-based approaches to food safety, promote evidence-based decision-making from farm to fork to physician, and considers the connectedness of human, animal, and environmental health. So Dr. Kowalczyk has served on several national committees, including two National Academy of Sciences committees, and her current appointment to the US Food and Drug Administration, um, excuse me, Science Board. In addition to her extensive experience in food safety, Dr. Kowalczyk, has more than 10 years of experience as a biostatistician, conducting clinical research and providing support to data safety monitoring boards in the pharmaceutical industry. Her research interests include linking public health information with data from across the food system to enhance the understanding of foodborne disease epidemiology, supporting the development of evidence-based informed policies and practices that prevent foodborne illness, and changing behaviors around food safety across the food system. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Kowalczyk, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to present today. Um, a lot of what I am going to be talking about builds quite a bit on the previous speakers. Uh, next slide, please. So I think as everyone knows that's on this call and it's been mentioned previously, food safety is an important uh, global public good. It's critical to food security and nutrition and it causes a significant amount of disease burden each year uh, with the De World Health Organization estimating 600 million illnesses globally per year and children bear most of the burden of this. And I'm not gonna talk in a few minutes about um, foodborne illness is also associated with several long-term health outcomes, which are not necessarily recognized uh, by the broader public. Uh, of course, there's also a significant economic impact associated with food safety. This includes medical costs, lost productivity, loss of consumer confidence, and in particular in uh, low and middle income countries, reduced market access 
both internationally, but as well as to formal markets in country. And of course, when there are failures in the food safety systems, this leads to increased food loss and waste. So if we can improve food safety, we can address many of these costs. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned previously, and as I'm sure most of you know, the World Health Organization recently um, issued their first ever bur global burden of disease estimates for foodborne illness. Um, they estimated 600 million people or one in 10 people fall ill to foodborne illness each year and 400, resulting in 420,000 deaths, most of which occur in children. Uh, these illnesses and some of the long-term sequelae associated with them result in 33 million healthy life years lost. Um, and specifically, they use disability adjusted life years uh, for their um, health summary measure. So um, while these numbers are really interesting, um, they really have driven a lot of changes in how we look at food safety globally. Um, I'm a statistician and I love numbers. Um, but what really puts these numbers in perspective is this is on par with the burden of malaria and tuberculosis and HIV. And if you look at the amount of funding that has gone in globally to preventing those diseases compared to the amount that's been uh, invested in preventing foodborne diseases, there's a significant difference. And these burden of disease estimates, which have come from surveillance and it speaks to what Martin was talking about earlier, you know, we, what gets measured is what gets done or what you, you measure what you treasure. Being able to measure the economic burden of foodborne illness has really dri driven increased awareness and investments in this area. So these burden of disease estimates were very significant um, in not just the funding um, through the food, not just the establishment of the Food Safety Innovation Lab, but also has driven other investments as well. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned previously, uh, most people think about foodborne illness as uh, in the acute form, causes diarrhea, but there is emerging evidence uh, over the years um, that foodborne pathogens are associated with several chronic sequelae. And I've summarized uh, these here. This is from a review that I co-authored but um, you know, you have many foodborne pathogens are associated with uh, reactive arthritis. Uh, Campylobacter is a common trigger for Guillain-Barre syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome and other functional bowel diseases have a significant impact on public health systems and on individuals um, and have been associated with several foodborne pathogens. You have neurologic disorders ranging from sepsis and meningitis to cognitive impairment and visual and hearing impairment, epilepsy. Um, and of course, shigatoxin producing E. coli has been associated, it is a major cause of hemolytic uremic syndrome, and that can cause several uh, chronic sequelae, um, particularly around uh, kidney, kidney disease. And then there are some recent studies um, show that there are some other uh, chronic sequelae that we may not have recognized as being foodborne in nature to be uh, previously. These include some studies from John Hopkins that had found an association between Toxoplasma gondii and schizophrenia and other psychosocial disorders. And they're starting to, there's emerging evidence that urinary tract, a significant portion of urinary tract infections um, may actually be foodborne in nature. And those global burden of disease estimates that we saw before don't include most of this. And so you often need to think about those as a lower bound of the burden of foodborne disease. So for example, when we look at um, the burden of foodborne disease in, and particularly STEC in Africa, WHO only included one HUS case for the entire continent. And that was because of lack of surveillance data. So I always think of those as a lower bound. Uh, the true burden is probably much higher. Next slide, please. So of course this burden varies by uh, region and subregion. You can see here uh, it's broken out in Africa and Southeast Asia, and then uh, uh, the Middle East bear the biggest burden. Um, and there is a significant, it's estimated over 91 million illnesses per year in Africa. Next slide, please. So of course, one of the things we have to do and that's been mentioned previously is how do we manage the risks? We have a very complex food system. 
Um, I usually like to show a picture from the National Academy of Sciences of a salad that has ingredients from all over the world. But when you're working in low and middle income countries, the, how do you, the, the complexity of the food system is much different. And this is just some pictures that we took in Ethiopia uh, from a project that we're working on. And you can see there's lots of different food risks that we have to manage uh, in order to um, prevent foodborne disease. Next slide, please. And of course, given the complexity of the food system, it's not surprising that there's failures. And these are just two that I'm sure you're probably aware of. Um, we had one of the worst listeria, I think the world's worth, worst listeriosis outbreak in South Africa. And then uh, there was quite a bit of publicity around mycotoxins in milk that resulted in the dumping of thousands of liters of milk uh, in that country. And of course, this feeds into food security and nutrition. Um, so next slide, please. So the question is, how do we go ahead and manage these risks? We can't do everything we possibly want to do in food safety, and I, I, several of the speakers have referred to this. And so it's internationally agreed that the best approach to preventing foodborne disease and improving food safety is a risk-based approach. Um, this is from a uh, National Academy of Science committee that I served on, and we defined what a risk-based approach was. We, we found that the term was used a lot, but there were no clear definitions. So when I talk about a risk-based approach, I mean one that is proactive and data-driven, grounded in risk analysis, um, ranks risks based on public health impact, and then prioritizes the allocation of those risks um, based on that. And of course, we always have to recognize as much as scientists love to think we make, make decisions based purely on science, there are other real uh, important factors that, that have to be considered in decision making. And those can include perception, cost, feasibility of implementation, environmental market impacts. And then a risk-based food safety system does evaluate and provide feedback on the risk management. And importantly, a risk-based approach is systematic, transparent, and involves all stakeholders. And I'd like to just note that the, this, the graphic here um, outlines the six steps in a risk-based food safety system. And it's drawn in a circle with an arrow for a reason because it's really about continuous process improvement. We're going to be continually improving over time. It's not, you do this once and you're done. Um, next slide, please. So the burden of disease estimates are really important and those, are, those come out of surveillance. So I'm in full uh, agreement that we need to make investments in surveillance systems. Basically what we're trying to do is take a whole bunch of risks that we have and we need to rank them in some way so we can allocate our resources to have the biggest impact on public health. And for risk, there's two dimensions of risk. There's the likelihood that the risk is gonna occur and then the severity of when it does occur. So you can think about this as the population burden versus the individual burden. And so you're gonna to have to make decisions on where to focus your resources. Next slide, please. So I really like presenting data this way um, because I think it's really informative. So here is an example from Havilar et al. This was done out of the Netherlands, and they ranked these the risks in the Netherlands based on uh, the population burden, which is on the x-axis, and the individual burden on the y-axis. Uh, the clouds around them, uh, they use simulations, so the clouds, the triangles are point estimates, and the clouds around them are the uncertainty from those simulations. But you can see when you look here, um, it's, it's one, it's a great way to communicate with policymakers who may not understand risk assessment and, uh, and safety. But you can see here that Toxoplasma gondii has the highest population burden and the highest individual burden. And that might suggest that we want to allocate resources to Toxoplasma gondii. On the other hand, Listeria monocytogenes has, as we, as expected, a really high individual burden. So we might say, well, as a, as a group, we want to focus on pathogens that have the highest individual burden or that it focus on uh, or more impact children, uh, which Listeria does. So this is really helpful um, in, in help, helping us understand where we should focus our resources. Next slide, please. So ideally in a risk-based food safety system, we would, um, 
estimate risk uh, across the supply chain. And there's two approaches, and we can talk about that another day, but there's the top-down approach, which really relies on surveillance, and you take those illnesses and attribute them to different foods, or you can use risk assessment, which is your bottom-up approach. Um, once you do, once you have your estimates of risk and the uh, public health impact, you can combine that with stakeholder engagement and cost benefit analysis to come up with a risk ranking that orders um, where you're going to allocate your resources. So I like to think about this as taking us from data to decision. Next slide, please. So risk ranking is really challenging. Um, there are several methods and tools out there, but oftentimes uh, people feel, get very overwhelmed. Where do you start? There's a multitude of hazards and foods. There's a, lots of different uh, methods, some of which can be very complex. And some of these methods for ranking risk can be really resource intensive. intensive. Now, most people recognize that a, full, a quantitative approach is the gold standard, but it's not always feasible or appropriate. It can take a huge amount of resources and time to do a fully quantitative approach. And sometimes you need quick decisions. So then you need to look at other, uh, other um, options. And so one of the things that's been recognized is that there is a, we need a structure um, so that we can build upon risk ranking efforts. And so a couple of years ago, I and some colleagues uh, worked with FAO to develop a guidance document on how to start ranking food safety risks. And that was just recently published. I can provide the uh, link to that if you're interested. Um, but really we, we focused on the diagram shown here. You know, the first piece is you have to define your scope. What are you going to rank? And are you going to screen those? You're going to develop the approach and that approach Ideally, you would pick the method and then you would select your metrics and then you would collect and evaluate your data. But sometimes that's really not how it works. You have to deal with the data that you have. And so that might actually drive your decision making. So we, we constructed that as a circle in the middle. And then the third step is to conduct the risk ranking and report the results. Next slide, please. So we, uh, when we worked with FAO, we had, uh, we, we had hoped to pilot the risk ranking uh, guidance document, but there were insufficient resources to do that. Um, so I have a project in Ethiopia where we're using that. And I also have a project um, in Kenya, Chikula Salama, uh, that we are going to be using this framework uh, to look at improving food safety. Um, so Chikula Salama was, is funded by the Food Safety Innovation Lab, the Feed the Future Food Safety Innovation Lab. And I just wanted to give a quick highlight of what we're going to be doing so that you can see this is how we would go about applying uh, an, a risk-based approach in food safety. So the goal of Chikula Salama is to improve food security and nutrition in Kenya by developing capacity for risk-based approaches to food safety, reducing risk of foodborne disease, increasing production of safe food and improving economic outcomes. And the key outcomes for this project are increased resources in Kenya to implement such a, uh, an approach and a roadmap for making risk-based decision makings and allocating resources that can be extended to other value chains, pathogens, or, or countries. Next slide, please. So given our limited resources, or, or given the resources on this project, you know, we couldn't tackle all foods, all hazards in Kenya, that would not have been feasible. So we decided to focus on poultry. Um, and we chose poultry because it's an important dietary component for Kenyan households, and it's a significant source of income for women and youth, as well as the fact that traditional processing often occurs in informal settings and rarely includes uh, mitigation strategies, making it a high-risk food. And we further decide to focus on salmonella and campylobacter in poultry value chains managed by women and youth farmers in peri-urban areas of Kenya. Next slide, please. Um, there's four objectives in the, in the project. The first one is to identify priorities uh, for the poultry value chains using a risk-informed approach. Then we're going to characterize salmonella and campylobacter in the poultry value chains we're going to develop and evaluate the efficacy of intervention strategies for mitigating salmonella and campylobacter in those value chains. And then we're gonna estimate the public health impact and evaluate costs and benefits from the selected intervention strategies. Next slide, please. 
So um, I wanted to, there's not a lot of time and I know I need to finish up, but this is a pro an overview of the project. Um, you can see uh, there are several different components. Um, our overarching goal is to inform risk based decision making. So we're going to focus on risk ranking and prioritization. We're going to be conducting gender analysis and identifying uh, stakeholders. We're then going to work with stakeholders to conduct a scoping workshop, a prioritization, prioritization workshop, and then we should have a prioritized list of interventions. Um, we're then going to evaluate those interventions because uh, that's an important piece. If we're going to spend a lot of resources to implement interventions across the country, you need to ensure that they have the benefit, they have the impact that you want them to have. So we're going to, um, I, we're going to randomly select producers, we're going to collect samples pre and post intervention, and then we're going to use that to characterize uh, contamination evaluate the effectiveness of that intervention, and then we're going to conduct risk assessments to estimate the public health impact, as well as cost benefit analyses uh, to hopefully inform decision making around these. And their capacity building is a very important part of our project, because ultimately what we want is for there to be increased capacity in Kenya for the, this type of work. Next slide, please. I just want to acknowledge the project team. Um, There's several of us at Ohio State that are involved. Uh, we have partners at University of Florida, uh, Kenya Medical Research Institute, and University of Nairobi. Um, and with that, I know we're, we, we are running short on time. Um, I thank you for your attention. And uh, next slide uh, has my contact information, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Kowalczyk. We do have <clears throat> questions coming into the chat. And um, if all our panelists are ready, I can start with Dr. Weedman. And you talked about salmonella and the importance of salmonella. Um, and you talked about surveillance a lot. In terms of antibiotic resistance, what, what do you surveil and what do you do with that information? Well, so there, there are a couple of different ones. So one of them is to get the actual isolates to do surveillance for salmonella and then do salmonella and uh, do antibiotic resistance testing. So that could be the classic low copy molecular. Um, you could also test directly for antibiotic resistance genes, which, you know, technologically challenging, not sure how relevant this is going to be, you know, in low middle income countries for the next few years. What do you do with the information? Well, one of them, you will monitor for emergence of new resistance types. You see new resistances emerge, you ask the question, why is this happening? Are we using different antibodies in humans? Are we antibiotics in humans? Are we using them in or animals? Are we using them too frequently? Are we not using them correctly? And you then go back and help with the design of proper strategies for um, antibiotic use in animals or, and or humans. It can also drive your primary treatment decisions. So if you have a good information and say, you know, in this area, if you acquire salmonellosis through this means, you're most likely to see resistance to antibiotic A and B. That's not going to be your first line antibiotic you use for treatment. Because again, in many countries, we're not going to be able to do routine antibiotic resistance typing. And if we do, the results will take days or weeks too late for treatment decisions. So we can use it to proactively make better correct treatment decisions. Um, with regard to prevention, it also will help us um, prioritize prevention for vaccines, for example. I can't vaccinate against all 2,500 different seminal serotypes. But if I have two serotypes, one is resistant to many antibiotics, the other one is not, I'm gonna prioritize vaccinating against the strain that is highly resistant. So um, many, many applications of this information. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll direct this question to, to a specific panelist, but anyone can jump in. And uh, for Dr. Mwangi, there was a congratulations on your awarded uh, USA Feed the Future Animal Health Innovation Lab. Um, and the, the question is, is asking how you think the Animal Health Innovation Lab and the Food Safety Innovation Lab could work together to reduce foodborne and zoonotic diseases. Oh, well, thank you for that good question. Um, and I think the, the critical thing in my view is that the Food Safety Innovation Lab and the Food um, and the Animal Health Innovation Lab 
both are at least working on quantification of what is really an important uh, public health problem. Um, and I think the joint efforts within these labs to be able to show the importance of, say, animal diseases, some of which may be zoonotic, that uh, could also be foodborne, how important they are in the context of, of, of different environments. I think that's, that's, that's important because that's the information that, that, that governments are looking for for them to, 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 to take action. I think the other second uh, important thing is identification of solutions. I think it's one thing to know something is of important, uh, important public health. Uh, it's an important public health issue, but to identify a solution that, that you know, can be affected and how that is rolled out, uh, I, th I think at a community level or where the burden is highest is, is equally important. And the other thing I think is, uh, as, as Martin mentioned, um, measure, measuring impact and progress is really important, uh, particularly to sustain efforts that you know you want to reduce the burden and the impact of, um, of foodborne diseases. Then being able to measure how effective your interventions are and whether you are making progress is is um, I think is, is really an important thing. And, and I see that the two labs have uh, at least uh, common areas that, 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 that they can collaborate on on that. Great, thank you. Um, this one's for Dr. Kowalczyk. Um, you, you talked about burden of disease and um, a participant is asking you if you know of any economic models that show the costs and benefits of these different One Health interventions. Um, so there are some great examples of cost benefit analyses. And I think that one thing we don't do well in public health and in food safety is, is do those cost benefit analyses. But the first one that comes to mind is a US example. Um, Rob Scharf, who is one of my partners on uh, the project I have in Ethiopia, as well as the project we're initiating in Kenya, um, in 2016, he did a cost benefit analysis on PulseNet, which is uh, the surveillance system here in the United States for foodborne disease, and it does molecular surveillance. And they found just for three pathogens, Salmonella, E. coli, and Listeria monocytogenes, that the annual cost of PulseNet to the US government was $7.3 million. But because of PulseNet, there were 200, over 270,000 illnesses averted, resulting in a $500 million savings to the economy. And so when you start talking about that and you can put that uh, return on investment cost into perspective, right? You talk to policymakers, you can say, we invest $7.3 million. We, from just three pathogens, um, save 500 million. That's a, a, great, um, a great example of a cost benefit analysis and people understand that. Um, so what we're hoping to do in our projects is similar cost benefit analyses and build economic models that will uh, do the same thing around specific interventions and build capacity in both Ethiopia and Kenya for doing those, building those types of models. Great. So I'm gonna open this one up to anyone you can jump in. Uh, Bushmeat is an important food source in some African countries. And how do parts of food safety and One Health address this part of the food system? This is Martin. So, I mean, it, absolutely agree. It is an important um, food source and it is a really important um, potential transmission route for zoonotic diseases. I think it's, it's a very complex to manage it. It's sort of a the social you know, the interface with social sciences. Um, some of their think potentially more successful strategies is to help um, develop alternative sources of, of, of meat. You know, they could even, and I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb there as much, I mean as much as um, farming or growing bush meat or some of the traditional bush meat species and the more um, confined conditions which you know, is not gonna be popular with a lot of people, but I think we also need to sort of slowly move towards some different transitions. We need to in include and, and acknowledge people's historical food preferences and, and see how we can work with that. Um, you know, there's some examples of even, so those would be some examples where I would, I would go. And then 
The other thing is to, to drive potentially and, and have, make sure the, the communities that use bushmeat would have advantages of certain practices that preserve these species, you know, sort of, you know, whether that's through tourism, how do we make sure the financial benefits flow through the right communities, et cetera. So that's gonna take a very broad collaboration. Now, this is Barb. Um, I think one of the things that uh, you know is really needed when you're thinking about different food safety risks and and different uh, you know when we're talking about changing addressing food safety, we're talking about food and that's tied into culture. So you really do need strong um, socio and behavioral research to understand um, what the cultures are, what is driving decision making and how we can effectively communicate risk um, to stakeholders so that they are incentivized or at least understand why they should be changing their behaviors. And so um, I think really to address food safety and One Health, you need to understand all the complexities of the system and what's driving individual decision-making. Well, related to that, could if there's a question, if anyone could share studies that are looking at correlations between more malnutrition and incidents and in zoonotic diseases in pastoral communities. I'm not aware of any. I don't know what someone else is. Um, so I'm not aware of any that are in pastoral communities. If we're looking at the, it, could you repeat that? The incidence of human health? Um, correlations between malnutrition incidents and zoonotic diseases uh, in pastoral communities. I'm not aware of any off the top of my head. There's a new area of study. Uh I could make a comment and say, we are collecting that kind of data in Northern Kenya, where we are focusing on malnutrition in children, um, but also looking at infectious diseases that come from livestock uh, to people. And so maybe if this is held another six months from now, we might have some interesting data regarding the relationship between say infection to brucellosis, Q fever, Rift Valley fever, um, and, and, and the risk of malnutrition in these in this, in this communities. Yeah, and actually um, I would change my answer on that. Um, I think Ari Havilar um, from University of Florida has some projects in um, Ethiopia looking at Campylobacter and nutrition outcomes as well. And that's funded through uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well as um, what used to be known as DFID, which I can never remember. <laughs> the new acronym. Okay, thank you. So uh, this question is um, directed to Dr. Mwangi, but anyone can, can jump in. But how does the push for biodiversity increase uh, or play a role in zoonotic disease emergence? So the balance between wildlife and farm, so livestock and crops, seems tricky and less tangible for food producers to implement widely. Any thoughts or advice on this? I mean, this is Martin, maybe I can start the conversation. I mean, obviously there are plenty of examples of a close proximity of wildlife to, to farm animals leads to transmission of zoonotic diseases from wildlife to farm animals and vice versa. It goes both ways. So that's really, really important um, to mention. Um, and so, you know, if you wanna manage the impact on farm animals, you know, vaccination, understanding the zoonotic diseases present and vaccination is one, you know, separation as effectively as possible is another one, but it, it's a well-recognized issue. Yeah, it is interesting because you, and when you're raising animals, the more closely related those animals are, the, the it's oftentimes the easier it is to make um, health plans. Um, so a push for biodiversity can, can run counter to that. Um, so we're gonna go to, um, we're gonna go back to you, Martin. So the resources are limited. What are two or three efforts uh, you, you would invest in to begin the process of disrupting transmission? Well, again, and it's, it's not disrupting transmission, but a prerequisite is gonna be surveillance. I'm gonna put in the right surveillance systems that I can identify, you know, 
what are the issues, and then continue to monitor whether my interventions work. Um, the specific interventions will differ based on what your issues are. Yeah, so if your issue, if anthrax comes up, vaccination will be a very effective means. So, so for some um, zoonotic and food analysis, vaccination will be high on the list. For other ones, it, it will be behavioral change. So that could be, you know, hand washing, um, distancing between animals and, and humans, no, no cohabitation, um, you know, how you treat your foods. And again, there's a lot of, you know, cultural context there. It's not going to be that different, but I think hand washing, I think I mentioned already. So that will be, be a second one. So I think, you know, vaccines and, and, and um, cultural or um, socioeconomic or inter behavioral intervention will be the two key ones I would focus on. Um, after that, it gets, it gets trickier in a, in a hurry. Um, and, and some of them could be animal breeding. So the, inter, so the intersection with, the, with, the, um, with other innovation labs to get resistance or increased resistance to certain zoonotic pathogens to reduce the risk from animals. So that will be a, a distant third, but I think more in the long, long range. Well, I'll open it up to other panelists too, in terms of the three, um, three areas efforts you would invest in to begin um, this process of either reducing transmission or disrupting transmission or, or improving food safety in general. So I would have to agree with Martin. I mean, surveillance and understanding the burden of disease in a country is incredibly important. So in Ethiopia, um, Ethiopia doesn't necessarily have, um, they, they have some surveillance systems, but not for foodborne pathogens. And so we're going to conduct a series of epidemiologic studies to, uh, try to estimate the burden of foodborne disease. Um, also the World Health Organization had um, developed some country specific, at least regional spe regionally specific estimates, but all, as also some country specific estimates that you can use those as a starting point to drive decision making. But in better understanding burden and surveillance is critical. Also building capacity among stakeholders um, to use a more evidence-informed approach. I think this happens across all countries. Um, you know, uh, for example, in Ethiopia, there's a lot of interest in mycotoxins and pesticides because it's been in the news and that happens in the US as well, right? You see outbreaks in the news and people wanna focus on that. Um, and really, if you use a risk-based approach, you would use evidence from burden of disease and, and engagement of stakeholders to um, better understand where to allocate those resources rather than reacting to the newest outbreak. Well, a follow up on that then, how do you ensure that when you're working with these different countries, how, how do you kind of uh, sell the quant qualitative risk assessment for food safety management? How do, how do you get people to embrace that approach? Um, it's a challenge. I think it's a challenge in the U.S. to always get people to embrace that approach. Um, and, you know, we found that uh, in Ethiopia that we brought, we had a lot of stakeholder meetings and brought people together. And, and we've done a lot of outreach and training on risk-based methods, as well as risk um, assessment, risk ranking and risk prioritization. And that helps. Um, and, but the stakeholder engagement is really critical. One of the things that we heard uh, we've heard in Ethiopia repeatedly is that our workshops were the first time a lot of them had gotten together in one location to talk about food safety and risk-based approaches to food safety. So that really, that stakeholder engagement, I cannot um, under underemphasize or overemphasize the importance of that. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone, all the panelists and all the um the participants as well. We have a lot of questions and we didn't get up to all those questions, but um, each of the presenters has given you contact information. So feel free to um, give them a shout out and ask your question to them uh, that way. And I want to uh, remind everyone that we do have another webinar just like this um, on food safety and nutrition in February of 2021. So um, if you look at the chat right now, you'll see a link to get email updates um, you can uh, follow that link and you'll get um, 
updates as to when that those this next webinar is happening and uh, and how to sign up and register for it. And again, thank you for all the great questions. Um, really, really uh, great information. Thanks for all the panelists. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Ahmed. If there's nothing else, we can conclude. And we look forward to seeing you in February of 2021. Thank you, everybody.